Well, it is good to be here this morning. It is good to have everyone with us today. And I've been pondering a subject that really is a continuation from last week. And I think it is essential that we look at this subject before we uh, really move forward. But I've titled it, A New Heart for the New Man or the New Woman Under the New Covenant. A New Heart for the New Man or the New Woman Under the New Covenant. Now, that's one of the longer titles I think I've ever had for a lesson or message, but it really takes that many words to sort of capture what I want to talk about. Um, if you have your Bible, I want to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and beginning around verse 7. And we will just kind of go from there. The writer of the Hebrews has built a tremendous case uh, for maintaining faith in Jesus Christ. He has spoken of the new covenant. We'll begin to really delve into it here. Uh, of the supremacy of the new covenant and how God had ultimately been working out his plan in the lives of his people and also of the Gentiles. But the thing that really grabs me about the book of Hebrews is it's written to a people who were in danger of going back uh, to their old life, going back under the law or, as we might say, backsliding apostatizing. So the writer of the Hebrews builds a powerful case uh, and gives many instructions to prevent this from happening. And uh, in the second chapter, he asked the people, if we neglect so great a salvation, if God were to reward us for every bad thing we've ever done, how will we escape? And that is a tremendous question. But then you hear this repeated phrase or this repeated statement over and over, and it simply says, or in, in similar ways, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Now, it is important, it's essential that we understand that God has many different ways of making impressions upon our heart. He moves by His Spirit through conviction. He may speak to us in a sermon. He may speak to us through a teaching. Or maybe while we're in prayer. Or maybe while we're reading the Bible or we're in devotions. He could even use something as simple as a billboard or a bumper sticker to in some way make an impression upon our heart. And the Bible says not to harden ourselves against God's dealings, no matter how subtle, no matter how uh, seemingly insignificant. God wants us to hear and to respond to him uh, when he is dealing with us. The old timers used to say that we are responsible to God for all of the dealings and all of the impressions that God makes upon us. Because when he makes these impressions, he's attempting to start a work in our life dealing with something that's important to him. And we must not quench, as, as the scripture says, the Holy Spirit. We have to allow God to do his work. Now, the flip side of that is what we just mentioned. It is to harden ourselves against the dealings of God. We were pulling out of the driveway this morning, and I had never noticed this before. Uh, I think it was last year they put all new sidewalks in our neighborhood. But down about where I stepped into the van, because we was parked right over the sidewalk, I noticed where a leaf apparently had fell on the concrete while it was wet, and it made an impression. And I guess after the weather had washed away everything, you could see where that leaf had been. And I thought, man, that is an awesome illustration. 
even the most subtle of impressions can make a difference while there is tenderness. But once hardness comes, you could stack the leaves a mile high. How many of you know what I'm saying? And you're not going to make that impression. It's while there's a tenderness. It's while there's a, is a softness. And it's true in our hearts. And the Bible warns us not to harden our heart. And the second thing that hardens our heart, the Bible says, is the deceitfulness of sin. God deals with us. He wants us to take a different direction, not do certain things or do certain things. We harden ourselves against that. And then that's followed up by the hardness that's caused by the sin you commit. Sin hardens our heart. And the situation had gotten so serious in Israel, and I am going to read my text in, in a minute, but the situation had gotten so serious in Israel that Jeremiah said that your sin is written upon your heart with the pen of iron and with the tip of a diamond. Now, that's a pretty hard heart, isn't it? If you need a diamond to make a scratch on something, that is awful hard. But I will tell you this, you wouldn't just wipe that off either. You wouldn't just go up like to a dry erase board and wipe it off. I remember when we were in school, we had these large green blackboards. I doubt if they still use them. A green blackboard, that's almost kind of... And I remember that the teacher would have a student each day go out get a bucket of water. They would dip the big sponge on there and they would clear that whole board and it would be perfectly clean. But how many of you know she wasn't writing with an iron pen with the tip of a diamond? She was writing with chalk. And the children of Israel's hearts were so hardened... And as it were, their sin had been so impressed into their heart that it was, it was no longer impressionable. It couldn't be really changed. So God said that He would take out their heart of stone and He would give them a heart of flesh. I don't know about you, but that's almost a place to shout. God will take out your old hard, stony heart that is bent on sin, that is bent on rebellion, and He will give you a heart that is once again sensitive to even the most subtle of His impressions. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? I wonder if you believe this morning that God has the power to change a heart. The Bible uses the Impression, get yourself a new heart or make yourself a new heart. And and scholars will look at that and say, well, man, how can you do that? Well, simply by going to God and asking Him, Lord, I need You to change my heart. Now, how many of you know there's a tremendous difference between a change of heart and a changed heart? People have change of heart all the time. You know, they like something one day and they don't like it the next. Well, what happened? Well, I had a change of heart. And these are kind of fickle kind of ways that people have. But when God changes the heart, it doesn't only give you a tenderness, but it also has the effect of changing your very nature. Your, your, Your very disposition changes from being someone that has a propensity to want to rebel and to want to sin and to constantly be bent in that direction to someone who wants to obey God. In the language of, again, the book of Hebrews and other places, God said, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write it. That takes tenderness. And I want to read this text to you. This morning, Hebrews 8, chapter 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. But finding fault with them, notice not with it. The problem was never with the law. The law was spiritual, the Bible tells us. 
Paul said the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. The law wasn't the problem. It was them. And he tells us that clearly here. The first covenant, if it had been faultless, in other words, if it had been able to accomplish under the circumstances what was necessary, there wouldn't have been a need for a second. But there was a problem that existed in the hearts of men that required another covenant. Now, the first covenant shows man their sinfulness. And God taught us a lot about himself under the first covenant. But the thing that it did most was it took us by the hand, as it were, and it led us to Jesus Christ. It showed us our need for him. It showed us our need for a changed heart. Now, notice what this says. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with, the, with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will have mercy mercy upon their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquity I will remember no more. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant could not effect the change and perform the thing that God wanted, so he established a new covenant. The problem ultimately, of course, was with the people. Now, I want you to notice something that the Scripture says here, and I've mentioned it already. But he says, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write it. If you look at 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 3, around verse 3, the Bible, Paul uses this expression of fleshly tables of the heart. And God writing, or in other words, impressing the very image of Christ upon the fleshly tables of our heart. This is a tender heart. So what is implied in this verse is that the person that is under the new covenant, genuinely under the new covenant, has had their heart changed. It has been replaced. How many of you know it needs more than just a simple remodel? You can pour all the water in the world on the concrete outside and it's not going to loosen up. And that's the way a stony, hardened heart is. God has to take it out and put a new one in. And that is a radical thing to do. A lot of people think, well, they just need a subtle little change. If I just do a few New Year's resolutions and get on a different track, then that's all I need. But that's just not the case. If you're ever going to be what God wants you to be under the new covenant, You have to have a new heart. You have to have God change out your heart. Well, that that sounds kind of simple, doesn't it? Oh, well, you know. But I wonder if you really do believe God can do that. You know, there are people that have been doing the same old thing for so long, they don't believe they can change. There are people that are not here this morning, that are not here probably as a result of the fact that they don't believe they can ever change. They've tried it before. They, you know, I did that. It didn't work for me. Uh, These kind of things are said. But the question is, did they ever come to the place to where they allowed God to truly change? Not change as in change the paint on the wall. I mean change out, swap out their heart. As if I went outside and pulled the engine out of my van and dropped a new one in. How many of you know that's different than rebuilding it? Especially if I put a much larger one in. A much more powerful one. That's what God wants to do. 
I want to show you this morning, and I've used this illustration before, I want to turn over to the book of Daniel chapter 4, and I want to show you how powerful God is. And just how easy it is for Him to change a heart. Now I thought, well, maybe we could talk about how God changed Saul's heart. You remember that? God had anointed Saul to be king of Israel. And the Bible said God changed Saul's heart. But Within two years, he had hardened himself against God. And the very heart God had given him, he had ruined and corrupted. And before you know it, he's rebelling against God, doing things presumptuously, and ultimately he lost the kingdom. Before it was over with, he wasn't seeking the Lord for advice, but he was visiting the witch at Endor. So how do you go from getting a new heart to visiting the witch at Endor? I'll tell you how. By not listening to what the writer to the Hebrews says. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You can ruin a perfectly good heart. If it couldn't be ruined, then why did the writer of the Hebrews tell us not to harden it? If it couldn't be hardened, why would the scripture say your heart can be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin? God will give you a new heart, but then it becomes our responsibility to make sure it doesn't become corrupted. It doesn't become hardened again. There are some people that maybe at one point in your life you were genuinely changed, but now the pattern of your life may be very much like it was at one time. And you've moved into a state of carnality. But God has the power to give you a new heart. He can change your heart. In Daniel chapter 4... I don't know, I don't, I don't have it marked in my Bible, and it would take me a minute to find it, so I might just read it from here. To give you a little backdrop of the story, Nebuchadnezzar had sacked Jerusalem. God had given him the power to overthrow the Jews. He had carried them off along with many of the articles, the golden artifacts that were in the temple that were used in the service of God. And he brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel all to the front. They became ultimately uh, his sort of his advisors, if we can say that. And God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And in this dream, you know, we have the head of gold and the whole thing all the way down to the feet. But Nebuchadnezzar kind of He must have took that wrong or something because you get to the third chapter and he's making an image. And then they're like, well, we're not bound down to this. So they put him up in the fire and you know the story. They come out without even the smell of smoke. Now, that's a powerful move of God. And I wonder if while the Jews were in Babylon, they really recognized That God could change them and change them to where they had a heart after him. Well, God gets a huge, you know, story in his resume, as it were, which is infinite, in how he can change a heart. The story is that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in this particular dream... To make a long story short, he was horrified by the fact that ultimately, if he did not stop with his pride, God was going to take his mind. Now, we say take his mind. He was going to take out the heart that he had, which was of a man, and going to give him the heart of a wild beast until he learned his lesson. Any of you read that story? Hmm. And for about the first year, you know, he was like, well, you know, and that's the way it is, isn't it? But, you know, God doesn't make idle threats. When God says the next time, he means the next time. And so here's Nebuchadnezzar, who had sort of had a change of mind for about a year, changes it back and he's looking around and he's talking about in in his heart how great he is and what a great job he's done and how awesome he is just paraphrasing oh nebuchadnezzar when you hear those words i mean you know it's bad 
you are going to be driven from men. And the next thing you know, his heart like a switch is flipped. And he goes from being a man with all the sensibilities and all of the affections of a man to having the affections of a wild ox. And he goes out into the pasture for like seven years. He's chewing the cud like a wild beast. How many of you know that cows chew the cud? But he is a regular circus act. And this happened until his fingernails grew out like eagle's claws. And his hair grew out like feathers. My mom and dad was talking about how the dog, you know, wasn't really at home in the house, no matter how cold it was. I mean, you know, it got pretty cold in the last few weeks. You know, they got this big old dog. I don't know, it's maybe 100, 200 pounds. No exaggeration. If I walked in this room, everybody would be like, whoa. But they figure, well, we'll bring the dog in. We'll lay out a blanket in the kitchen. And we'll keep the dog from getting too cold. Now, they had given him a dog house, put a big bunch of hay up in there, and they dug a hole and would lay in there and look around and stuff and stay warm. But, you know, man, it's, she's liable to freeze to death. We're going to bring her in. But the funny thing was, when they let her out the next day to go to the restroom, she wouldn't come back in the house. How many of you know the dog doesn't have the nature to want to be in the house, no matter how cold it is? She wouldn't come back in. That's what happens when your nature is what it is. The dog's got a nature to be a dog, and it's always going to be at home outdoors. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He went from sitting on his plush pillows, being fanned, having people you know, bring him golden goblets or whatever to eat and drink out of, to grazing in the pasture until the dew was covering him like an animal. I mean, it might as well be we were down somewhere in, you know, in Adrian or somewhere in a farmer's field. They're just gra- He's grazing around. I can see people standing looking at the fence. Look at him. Hmm? And he wasn't putting it on. He wasn't faking this. This went on for seven years. I mean, he didn't care how he looked. He didn't care how long his hair grew. He didn't care how long his fingernails went. I mean, he was just not a man. He was an ox from the heart. And after the time was over with, God flipped the switch again. And back came his mind. And he went right back up into the palace, got all cleaned up, sat back down in his chair, and there he was. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a pretty powerful demonstration to me of the power of God to change a heart. I don't care if he can change a beast, Lee Hart, back into a man. He can change a sinner back into a saint. To the flip of the switch. Just like that. I mean, it's no big deal to him. He did it just like if he was just taking a stroll down the street. Didn't even sweat it. But the conditions have to be right. Now, the situation isn't the same with the saint and with Nebuchadnezzar, but once Nebuchadnezzar met the conditions that God said, your heart's going to be changed, how many know it happened? And it's the same way with the saints. If you truly want your heart changed, you've got to meet the conditions. You've got to be sincere. You've got to seriously want to be changed. God's got to be able to believe you. How many of you know he could see Nebuchadnezzar's heart? No matter what his mouth was really saying, he was watching the condition of his heart. And at the moment that heart reached critical mass, boom, that was it. The voice came from heaven and he was driven from men. You know, it's, so, it's, it's impossible to fake God out. So many people try to do it. I mean, I just really think one of the greatest problems that exist in the churches today or in the world today is people just have no comprehension of how powerful God is. 
Do you realize he's inside your mind like nobody's business? He knows you better than you know yourself at any given moment. He has, as a matter of fact, he's anticipating your actions up until the day you die. He knows everything that you're going to do. And when somebody's inside your head like that, inside your heart like that, there's just no way to fool him. But so many times people try to put it on and they are never truly changed from the heart. Their heart's never changed. And how many of you know you can only put it on for so long? You know, the dog down at the house, you know, was comfortable in the house for a little while, but it got a little hot in there. How many of you know that that's not their habitat? Now, it would have been crazy if mom and dad would have said, well, we got to keep the dog up in the house. So they would have tore the carpet out and brought the hay in, raised the windows. That would have been nuts, wouldn't it? Maybe some of you are seeing the allegory I'm using. I'm being very deliberate in what I'm saying. We can't raise the windows in the church. We can't fill the churches with hay. We've got to see the hearts of men changed until they're at home in the things of God. Not in a mixture. Not in a half dog house, half human house. That's where the change has to happen. Because we can't modify the things of God to fit. Not if we're saying. Now, if, you know, if we're kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, we're thinking like him, we may do something crazy like that. But that's not sane, is it? God has the power to change the heart of every person that walks through that door. So we don't have to change to accommodate them. They change to accommodate the kingdom of God. But if they don't meet the requirements, what are we going to do? If their hearts never change, what do we do? Do we, you know, I'm not going to tractor supply. I'm not getting a few bales of hay. We're not raising the windows. The kingdom of God is got to be the kingdom of God. And it cannot accommodate the things of this world. Amen. God wants to change hearts. He wants to change everyone's heart that hasn't been changed. Now, the question becomes, if our heart is changed, what can we expect? What can we expect our lives to be like as compared to the way they used to be? Well, I will tell you one thing is your affections are going to be set on the things above, not on the things of the earth. God will give you a whole new desire. Suddenly you you go from, you know, in the in the way of Nebuchadnezzar, he sat down to meals that would blow your mind. You know how you know Daniel and the guys refused to eat them. Say, well, no, we'll we'll just eat some porridge or something. We'll eat we'll eat just some simple food. We're not eating that. He was eating and living large. But once his heart was changed, his appetites changed. And suddenly he went from enjoying eating around the table to chewing a totally different type of food. And when you truly are changed by the power of the Holy Ghost, all of your appetites are going to change. You'll go from wanting one thing to wanting another. And I mean in a radical way. It's like, man, just... You just chuck that. I mean, just like Nebuchadnezzar, he walked right out of the front door of that palace right into the field. I mean, I I didn't read anywhere where it said that he was eating a plate of food out there in his wherever he was. I mean, when his nature changed, his appetite changed, and it wasn't evolutionary. I think evolution has so corrupted the church and the mindsets of the visible church, Christendom. God has a bride that's without spot or blemish. And lots of churches are doing God's will. I'm talking about the visible church as it's seen in the mainstream. 
They think that, well, what is Christianity? Well, you know, I'll just eventually evolve into being a Christian. You know, I'll start here and I'll evolve. No, there has to be a crisis event into which you know by the power of the Holy Spirit you've been changed and you can begin to grow from that point on. You've got to be born. When a baby's born, it has a pretty good appetite. I had, we had six children. I can tell you all about it. You know, I never had to wake any of the kids up in the middle of the night talking about here, you know. You got, you sure you want to eat tonight? Hmm? No, that child will let you know. I'm hungry. Get up now. And you're not going to have any peace. How many of you remember? I know it's been a while for me too. But I still remember. And when you are truly born again of the Spirit, the Bible says to desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. There is an appetite for the things of God and you don't put it on. You know, I've never seen a newborn faking it or having to be force fed. Not if they're healthy. Right? Now, you may have to give a feeding tube, but how many of you know that's not healthy and it's not normative? If you're born healthy... You have an appetite for God. You have an appetite for the things of God. And, and all of your parts are there. Yeah, they need to grow. Yeah, they need to develop. But all the parts are there. You don't, you know, wait six months and you get some lungs. Hmm? Another year or two and you grow arms. No. It's not evolutionary. You might be in infancy... But you're all there. And you have the nature, you have the heart of a human being when you're born. And likewise, when you're born again of the Spirit, I think we so underestimate what Jesus said. He looked at Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. John 3, 3. You must. You must. Not you kind of. Not you, we can, you know, we'll work this out over time. No, they tried. That's what the Old Covenant tried. The Old Covenant... You know, finding fault with them, a new covenant was necessary. And a new covenant makes the born-again experience possible. You can be changed into a new creature with a new affection, with new appetites, with new desires. But once God gives it to you, hear what I'm telling you, you're responsible to keep it, to nurture it, to make sure you don't harden it. To make sure that you don't corrupt it. I want to give you another example and then I'll open up for questions today. Of the power of God to change a heart. In the book of Psalm chapter 51, you will remember David had sinned a terrible sin. He was a man after God's own heart, but how many of you know he let some things into his heart? And that's a tragedy. But it can happen to any of us. You know, we live in a fallen world, and all of the things that we could be subject to in this world are there. And they're going to be there till we die or till the Lord transforms this world. But I want you to notice something, very familiar passage of Scripture. He talks about how he's, God is thoroughly acquainted with, it, with his iniquity. He's asking the Lord to transform him or to change him. But I want you to notice this. In verse 6 it says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. That's an admission of guilt right there. That was almost like he was saying, Lord, there's something in the inward side of me that isn't right. And, and this is really almost a prayer. He said, Purge me from hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Watch this. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I wonder if you ever just stopped there and, and meditated on what he said. God is the Creator. Just like he flipped the switch on Nebuchadnezzar, just like he changed the heart of Saul while he was going in the way, he 
David said, create in me a clean heart. My old heart was corrupt. My old heart was like Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds adulteries of one thing. But David knew the source and he said, Lord, do a supernatural recreation. Take the old one out and give me a clean one. And that was under the old covenant. That's the thing that puts a smile on my face. God could do that under the Old Covenant. How much more is He willing to give those who will ask, those who will turn to Him in genuine repentance and faith, a new heart under the New Covenant so that you can walk in the newness of life, a new man, a new creature in Christ. Amen. I want to just pray this morning. Lord, we're just so grateful for the exceeding great and precious promises that we find in the new covenant whereby we can be a partaker of the divine nature. Lord, you can create in any, any one of us a new heart. You can write your laws upon our heart that we would walk out the person of Jesus Christ by nature. Lord, as simple as you change Nebuchadnezzar, as simple as you change Saul, Lord, you can change the heart of each and every one. Lord, if there are those that have hardened themselves against you, and really there's just no hope for that old heart, I pray that, that there would be a prayer today. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart, a, a tender heart, a heart of flesh. Give me your spirit. Transform me. Baptize me into Christ that I could be dead and crucified to this world and alive unto You. Lord, I want a new affection. I want new affection. I want new desires. I want to long after You. I want to desire and hunger and thirst after You and Your Word and Your righteousness. In Jesus' name, Amen.